What is a lighthouse? It is a tower with a bright light at the top. Located at an important or dangerous place. The main purpose of a lighthouse is to serve as a navigational aid and to warn of dangerous areas. Welcome to the EMS Lighthouse Project podcast. Illuminating the darkness of current EMS clinical practice with the bright light of science. Here are your hosts, Dr. Jeff Jarvis and Mike Burkest. Howdy, y'all. I'm recording this breaking news podcast on Saturday, February 27th, to discuss the Johnson & Johnson or Janssen vaccine. The VRBPAC, now that's the Vaccines and Related Biological Products Advisory Committee, for those of you who might not live and die by the goings-on of the FDA advisory committees, well, they met yesterday to review the data submitted by Johnson & Johnson in support of their application for FDA emergency use authorization. Now, the bottom line is the committee voted unanimously to support the EUA application, and the full FDA is expected to grant EUA authorization sometime today. Now, we went in-depth on the two prior COVID vaccines that have received EUAs for two reasons. First, they were the first to be approved or to be authorized, and most of us would be likely to get one of those two vaccines. And second, they were mRNA vaccines. And that was pretty new. The science of it was new for us. So we wanted to go over that. Now, this J&J vaccine will be the third vaccine authorized for use in the U.S. And because it's a more traditional vaccine, I'm going to skip over all the details about how it works because it's pretty similar to other vaccines we've all had. I want to focus on the efficacy and safety data. In other words, the bottom line. Now, the data presented to the FDA is from the Ensemble trial. Now, it isn't yet published, so everything I'm presenting is from the FDA briefing document. Trust me on this, y'all. Wait for the trial to be published. A typical RCT will be to the point and be no more than about five, maybe six pages, about 3,000 words. This FDA briefing very much reads like a government document. It is neither brief nor to the point. In fact, it rambles a bit. It's a bit of a data dump. Now, if the two mRNA vaccine trials are any indication, I'd expect the ensemble trial to be published in one of the big three journals, either JAMA, New England Journal of Medicine, or the Lancet within the next few weeks. For the most part, this study is very similar to the prior two vaccine studies because they were done to meet FDA requirements. And since those requirements are the same, the studies are the same. One difference, however, is that the virus itself has changed between when this study was conducted and when the prior two studies were conducted. This study includes sites in the United States, Latin America, and South Africa, and that's really important. It includes the Wuhan strain, which is the dominant strain, as well as the apparently more virulent South African strains. Now, a couple of factoids about this vaccine. You may hear about this as either the Johnson & Johnson vaccine or the Janssen vaccine. It turns out it's both. Janssen was acquired by Johnson & Johnson a few years ago. It's basically their R&D arm. Same thing. The actual name for this vaccine is AD26.CoV2.S. That's a great name. It's derived from its mechanism. This is a vaccine that's built on an adenovirus that has been modified to prevent reproduction. The platform virus or the adeno component of it, which is also called AD26, it's just the vector, and it introduces the SARS-CoV-2 spike protein to our body, and that's what we have an immune response to. And that's the same protein 
that the mRNA vaccines are attacking, or I should say targeting. Now, the 8026 vector, it's also used in the Ebola vaccine that was recently approved by the Europeans, and it has been in use in various vaccine trials against Zika, HIV, HPV, RSV, and even malaria. And all told, over 193,000 patients have received a vaccine based on this viral platform. And it has a good safety profile. Now, the thing that's exciting about this vaccine is that it is a single shot, unlike the two mRNA vaccines. And, and wait, there's more, it is much more stable. That means it can be kept in regular refrigerators for up to three months it will be much easier to pull off the logistics of mass vaccinations because of these two factors. Now, there is another trial of this vaccine that is underway. It looks at the efficacy of a two-vaccine combination, but the results of that trial are not yet available. Johnson & Johnson chose to apply for EUA with this single-shot um, combination or single-shot approach because they understand how important logistics are to mass vaccinations. And I'm glad they did. It's very likely that the research on the two-shot combination is going to be more efficacious than what we're seeing with this vaccine. The big question, though, is what is good enough? Now, as before, a candidate vaccine needs to show greater than 50% efficacy for preventing moderate to severe covid with a lower confidence interval of more than 30%. That's what the FDA says we need to see for EUA. Now, the mRNA vaccines were um, just famously, unbelievably effective, 95% vaccine efficacy. Now, to put this in comparison, the annual flu vaccine, its efficacy varies from year to year, but it's usually somewhere between 50 and 80%. All right, so with that as a comparison, let's go through the basics of the trial. It's a multinational, double-blind, placebo-controlled, randomized trial. 41% of the study sites were in the U.S., 44% were in Latin America, and 15% were in South Africa. They enrolled adults 18 or older, and they randomized them in a one-to-one -one fashion to get a half milliliter intermuscular injection of either the vaccine or the placebo. As before, the primary outcome was vaccine efficacy at preventing moderate to severe or critical COVID-19 at two data points, either 14 days after vaccination or 28 days after vaccination. Now, for simplicity, I'm just going to report on the 28-day data here but there really weren't huge differences between 14 and 28. So if we're talking about moderate to critical or severe COVID, it's helpful to know what the case definition was. They said moderate to critical or severe COVID was a positive PCR test confirmed at their central lab and symptoms. And they said critical or severe COVID was same thing, positive PCR plus hospitalization from hypoxia, respiratory failure, end organ failure, ICU admission, ECMO, or death. And I don't know about y'all, but I'm not going to quibble with their definition of critical to severe. That sounds pretty bad to me. Now, overall, there were slightly over 21,000 patients in both arms and over 43,000 total patients. This is not by any means a small trial. The overall population, the median age was 52, and 67% of them were in the 18 to 59 age group. 34 of them were over 60, and then the, there was a 4% group that was actually over 75. The oldest person enrolled in the trial was 100 years old, and bully for him, or maybe her. So slightly more than half, or 55% were men, 59% were white, 29 black, and 3% Asians, and 41% had at least one comor comorbidity, and they did include patients with HIV. Now as a reminder of what their primary outcome is, that is vaccine efficacy, let's go over what the hell that means. The good news here is it's not complicated. 
it's one minus the risk ratio. And the risk ratio is just the ratio of the rate of disease in the vaccine group to the rate of disease in the placebo group. Now, bottom line, overall efficacy at least 28 days following immunization was 66%, and that had a confidence interval from 55 to 75. So it clearly met their definition, the FDA's requirement for EUA. Now, as with prior studies, an incident curve is a great demonstration of the differences in infection rates between the two groups. Now, the one with this paper isn't quite as impressive as the ones with the two mRNA vaccines, but it is still clearly effective. Now, if we look only at those patients with severe or critical COVID, the ones that we most want to prevent, the efficacy is 85% overall and 92% among those in the 18 to 59 year range. Now, that obviously is less in the over 60. It sits, uh, I'm sorry, 71% in that group. So overall, 85% at preventing severe or critical infections. Now, one thing to note here is that there were no COVID-related deaths in the vaccine group. So that is a very good thing. Now, the cool thing about this is that they report on the efficacy against asymptomatic infection, and that is really important. It's important because, as we all know, the ability for asymptomatic transmission with this virus is a big pain in our ass. This is one of the reasons that wearing masks is so important. The result in this trial is encouraging 60% efficacy against asymptomatic infection at least three weeks after immunization. Now, the safety data, also encouraging, and it's about what we've seen before. There were more adverse events in the vaccine group than in the placebo group, exactly as we would expect. Let's go over what they were real quick. Remember, you can break down adverse events into local and systemic effects. The local reactions are things like ouchy at the site, uh, redness, swelling, while systemic reactions are things like fever, fatigue, headache, myalgias, your run-of-the-mill flu-like illness. For local reactions, 50% had them in the vaccine group versus 20 in the placebo group. Now, less than 1% in either of the group had either a moderate or severe reaction. So these are really mild reactions. The most common localized reaction was pain at the injection site of uh, for 50%, redness in 7 and swelling in 5%. For systemic reactions, overall 55% in the vaccine arm and 35% in the placebo arm had at least one. The most common in the vaccine group was headache, that was 39%, fatigue in 38, myalgias in 33, nausea in 14, and fever in 9. All of these reactions were more common in that group younger than 60 than overall, than uh, the older group. So, what we see here is an overall efficacy of 66% against moderate or worse, symptomatic COVID. While that's obviously less than the amazing 95% seen with the mRNA vaccines, it is achieved with a single shot, and that is way, way more stable than the mRNA vaccines. And that means the logistics are way easier. For those of you who are involved with community vaccination efforts, you all know what a big deal this is. Now, locally, I've been drafted as the local health authority responsible for our vaccine efforts, and i got to tell you, I am damned excited about this. Now, as before, we see this is a safe vaccine. We also see what, for me at least, is the first evidence that we can prevent asymptomatic infection. We have been hoping we would see that with the prior two uh, vaccines, but we just don't have evidence yet. Here we have evidence. The reason this is such a big deal is it gives me hope that there is an end to wearing these masks. All right, guys, that's all I've got. Because I think this is a big deal, I wanted to get this information out to y'all quickly. 
Plus, I wanted to save you from having to read this document. Really, all it is painful. I really would wait for the ensemble study to be published and then read that. As always, I really appreciate what you do. Thank you for listening. Take care, y'all. You've been listening to the EMS Lighthouse Project Podcast, a proud member of the Flight Bridge Ed Podcast family and a Fire Dog production. Visit flightbridgeed.com for more information.